Hello, hello, and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I am your host, Eric Fisher. This is the show where we talk to the people behind the productivity. This week, I've got a returning guest in Chris Brogan. And yes, if you are listening to this on the release day, it is his birthday. So make sure to go tweet at him at Chris Brogan on Twitter and tell him happy birthday. What's funny is last week when we recorded this episode, it was actually my birthday and... Chris was awesome enough to sing me happy birthday when we connected on Skype. So that was actually pretty funny, pretty cool. Thank you, Chris. Chris has been doing a lot of stuff that's all been under the banner lately of ownership. He started Owner Magazine or OwnerMag.com. And we talk about that principle. What does ownership mean? What does it mean to be responsible for yourself? What does it mean to be in charge of yourself? What does it mean to just take responsibility for yourself? We get into talking about that and what does it mean? What does it mean to just stop being passive and start being proactive and intentional and moving forward in taking your life from average to amazing? Speaking of taking things from average to amazing, this episode is brought to you by Podcast Masterclass. You can find that at beyondthetodolist.com slash podcast masterclass. The Podcast Masterclass is where you can learn to take your podcast from average to amazing. It's hosted by my friend and award-winning podcaster, Daniel J. Lewis of the Audacity to Podcast and the Noodle Mix Network, which this show is proudly part of. This Podcast Masterclass will help you overcome what's holding your podcast back from success. It'll help you make money with your podcast, grow your podcast audience, host successful interviews, and more. It's designed to help you take your podcast seriously and make it successful. When you go to beyondthetodolist.com slash podcast masterclass, you get 16 hours of group sessions, up to six hours of one-on-one coaching, a thorough 120-point podcast evaluation, and personalized actionable steps to improve your show free and discounted podcasting resources, this total exhaustive training is realistically worth more than $6,000. If you're ready to take your podcast from average to amazing, then register today at beyondthetodolist.com slash podcast masterclass and use the promo code to do to save $200. There's limited space available, so sign up quickly for the next session. Visit beyondthetodolist.com slash podcast masterclass and use the promo code to do. Hey, real quickly, before we get into the conversation with Chris, stay tuned after the interview. I'm going to give some of the awesome and new podcasts that I'm listening to some shout outs there. Since I get asked a lot, hey, what shows do you listen to? I thought this would be a pretty cool opportunity to, you know, shine some spotlight on some of those new shows that you, as a listener of this show, may be interested in. So when Chris and I say goodbye and, you know, hey, thanks for being on the show and all that, just stay tuned for a little bit because it's not going to go right into, you know, closing credits and all that kind of stuff. Stay tuned, check out some new shows that maybe you haven't heard of yet, and hopefully you'll check them out and find some more value in those shows as well. Chris Brogren is back on the show this week. Welcome back, Chris. I'm thrilled. I, I'm only one of a few people I think are a repeat guest. Is that you, true? You are. I think it's it's less than ten. That's for sure. <laughs> and we're, man, we're oh nearing man. sixty something. So that's impressive. So awesome. I am so curious. When you started coming out and talking about Owner Mag, you started talking about uh, you said magazine, and I'm like, wait, all these people are saying print is dead. Why would someone do an online magazine what what's the meaning behind the word magazine to you why do you why are you choosing that well i you know so it's a, it's a great question and one is to not ever worry that the the word blog means something about uh you know very specific technology and so when you say blog it sort of throws people's brain into this one thing oh it's a sort of secondary thing it's this thing you do for fun in your basement or whatever um yeah, all you have to do is watch house of cards first season and you'll get that sense nice. but a magazine by definition is a periodical publication consisting of articles and illustrations to particularly covering a specific subject or area of interest. So um, 
Owner Mag is a periodical publication. We publish it on the first of every month. It contains articles and illustrations. We do cover a particular subject, business growth in the how-to sense, uh, and that's the area of interest. So it is a magazine. Well said. And I love the idea of it being like monthly. Was there any kind of like, hey, a magazine? I mean, I don't know if it's similar to you as as it is for me where you think of the word magazine and you f- think of something that's cool and shiny and fun and you look forward to getting once a month in the mail and unlike a newspaper it, does it, it you know that tangible oh man this awesome you know my new copy of wired showed up is that you're trying to kind of you know connotate some of that as well Absolutely. I wish to the sweet little tiny baby Jesus that that was true. Like I wish when people, you know, the first of the month, they're like, yay. And some people really like my magazine, but they're not just there. Uh, I think that that's the feeling I want. I mean, I love magazines. I go and buy magazines off the newsstand, you know, which costs too much. You know what I mean? Like it's dopey. I should be a subscriber, but I really like the experience of wandering around the newsstand, like at a Barnes and Noble or somewhere and really consuming what I want to look at, even if that means I pay cover price. Or even in the airport, because you're always in the airport. Love that. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you get that feeling, though, especially if you fly too many times in a row, you're like, oh, crap, I've been flying too many times. I've run out of things. I guess I'll have to buy like a Sudoku book or something. Right. So the subject matter, why, why owner mag? I know I get the whole business growth thing, but I know your usage of the word owner and ownership is honestly something we could talk about for hours, and we won't. But I want to scratch the surface and actually go farther than that. This this whole concept to me, when you started talking about it, like I I just got it. Like I, at least I think I do. I want you to help me get it more. How, what's an owner? So an owner is the kind of person who, at least at the very start, owns their choices and their responsibilities. They say, you know, I I am the person driving my own boat. It's uh, Covey's habit, habit one, be proactive, or I'm the programmer. So that's the very first thing is you take responsibility for who you are and what choices you're going to make in your life. And then you might be the owner of your cubicle for a while. I, for quite a long time, uh, because of an old um, Tom Peters article was the CEO of my cube. I still had a regular old day job just like anybody, but I truly thought about it like a CEO. I thought about what's my vision, what's the mission I'm trying to execute here inside the building, you know, who are my suppliers, which they thought of themselves as my coworkers, but I was there, you know, I, they were vendors to me and I really executed like an employeepreneur, uh, especially because the company that I was in, the last major company I worked in was like a wireless telecom and we were very entrepreneurial spirited uh, up until the end. And that's what calcified us was trying to get even more corporatized and the company ended up collapsing. But I left right before that to go join the circus and work with Jeff Pulver and stuff. Uh, right after that, you know, owners are people who decide they're going to run their own business. Entrepreneurs Entrepreneurs are owners, but not all owners are entrepreneurs. Uh, These sorts of people are the people who uh, take a great amount of risk onto their shoulders to get a reward. And I find that uh, it's very different than founders. Um, I talk sometimes to people who have startups and they're, they're working really hard to raise their money or they get their couple of million of other people's dollars and then they go around doing weird things that don't make sense to me, like not make revenue. And so the kind of owners that I'm also interested in in the business aspect, Eric, are people who actually have intentions of making money and who want to you know, kind of live on their own steam. Uh, what is also least true about the owners that I'm talking about, they are not – and I'm not trashing any of these people, but they're not the same kind of people that maybe want to listen to Pat Flynn's show and then live uh, on a beach and uh, watch palm trees go back and forth. And again, absolute love to Pat Flynn. I think that, you know, there's a subset of humans that think that all they have to do is get the right gimmick and they can go live on a beach. Mm. Yeah. 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 And, and, and even that's not like ownership. Like that's still laziness. Like that's right. I mean, it, that, could, that could be an end goal to somebody. But what kind of goal is that really? Right. I mean, I have one whole friend uh, that that has that sort of mindset that I appreciate. It's John Michael Morgan, who wrote Brand Against the Machine. But beyond John Morgan, uh, I don't have very many lazy friends. It's just not a it's just not a group that I hang with that much. Well, I'm going to tweet that out that you you called John Michael Morgan lazy on the absolutely. Show. And then anyway, you speaking of which, like you've just had some awesome people writing for owner mag, like Dave Delaney, Jeff Goins, John Michael Morgan, et cetera, et cetera, James L. Tucher. Like, how are you, I mean, people trust you, they know you, they get you, but, uh, who are, how, what's your vetting process for people writing for the magazine? 
so what what it almost always isn't are social media types. Um, I'm you know I've I've been so pigeonholed as a social media guy because I use a lot of the tools and I think the tools are great. But what I've always said is the tools are great for business, not you know just neato. I can tweet. So uh, a lot of people who are friends of mine via the social media channels or who are just marketers um, really aren't the right kind of writer for the magazine. So what I went after is people like Bob Berg, who uh, does a lot of sales help and a lot of leadership help. And um, Anthony Anarino is a sales guy. He runs thesalesblog.com. Dave Delaney, because of his business networking experience. So the fact that he's doing new business networking radio now is his own podcast. Uh, Dave's really got a very specific skill that I want. James, just because he's an absolute freak. I love James Altucher. Um, I would adopt him or marry him or anything. I, I would just, I just want to be near to him all the time because he's just such a brilliant and crazy mind. Uh, and then a few other people, uh, Brigitte Taruno, uh, Taruno. I was so lucky to ask her and my friend Raul Colon to write in Spanish on the magazine because I think it's really cool that we could actually talk to uh, the Spanish speaking population about business, not what I mean. Means to be, uh, you know, Hispanic or some flavor in the U.S., but or you know, as a business owner, but just in their language. Dory Clark, who's like a, a Forbes uh, and otherwise HBR writer about leadership and the like, plus a few fitness writers. We we since spun out an entire fitness magazine called Boss Fit, which is run by my girlfriend Jacqueline Carley. But we had uh, fitness and health in those magazines. I still do. Dr. Terry Simpson writes articles there, and he's a he's a surgeon. He does uh, lap band surgeries in the in the daytime, and at nighttime he tries really hard to convince people not to get lap band surgeries. <laughs> nice. Okay, so the fitness thing, um, that's that's a place where I see your ownership of your own life and your claiming of that just playing out in terms of your Instagram selfies. Explain that. Well, it's pretty darn hard to model the idea of being an owner and being a king if I can't control the distance between my hand and my mouth. And I just started to realize that it's just not a good plan to be, uh, you know, a big round person and using business as the excuse, because if I'm not condoning excuses in any other part of my life, why would I allow them in something like my health? And the other thing, Eric, is that what I found all the way around is that when I go to the gym, I get business ideas. When I go to the gym, I get energy that then I use throughout the day to, to work at a much higher pace and level of accomplishment. And the other thing that I've come to, to really appreciate, this is the weird thing that I never would have imagined. I am starting to get all kinds of contact and connection with people who shouldn't really give me the time of day. Retired commander, na- retired Navy SEAL commander, Mark Devine, who runs SEAL Fit, which is kind of like CrossFit meets Navy SEALs candidacy, reached right out to me. Uh, he's got a great book on mental toughness and a great book on fitness that just came out. And he totally wanted to talk to me because of things like fitness and health. Um, uh, it's opened up a whole new group of people. And so one of the other tenets I have in my mind as far as ownership goes is that health is kind of a new kind of wealth. We've heard that many times, right? It's, it couldn't be any more cliche to say health is wealth. But there's something more at play here. It's like a secret handshake club now. It's like that, that old Saturday Night Live skit when Eddie Murphy pretended to be white and people would just like give him TVs and stuff like that. I think there's truth to that. I think that if you are sort of working towards a certain level of fitness, you are treated very differently. Is it discrimination to treat unfit people a different way? Maybe. I don't know. I've been fat my whole life. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if I've been discriminated against, but I can tell you that there's a whole different experience that happens once you kind of you know, cross that line into at least amateur athleticism. Uh, and I found that pretty interesting. I've wondered that myself too. Like what if there's that subconscious kind of uh, discrimination or, or writing someone off in that you look at them and they're like, well, obviously, you know, someone looks at you and they say, well, he's, you know, however many pounds overweight or whatever. It just – it translates into an almost lack of discipline on their part that you just assume permeates their whole being, you know? Yes. Absolutely, Eric. That's the the thing I keep thinking is that how are they going to think I'm a disciplined person if I can't be disciplined with my hand and my mouth? And 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 that's really where it lands on for me. It's not so much you know going to the gym per se, but I like I said, I mean, these last two weeks very specifically since doing some of this seal fit stuff that Mark Devine's book has in it, 
I have more energy than I've ever had in my life. I feel like a stupid infomercial saying it like that, but it's totally true. And, you know, the other thing I'm thinking is so, you know, as we record this, it's your birthday. Sometime between now and the time it comes out, I'll have had my birthday. I'll have turned 44. And I would love to be really super sexy at 60. And I would love to be running around looking like a 40 something year old. And I think it's way more possibly true than it's ever been because I still have so many business goals. So I would hate to be like one of those golf cart oxygen people uh, that you see in Vegas, for instance. I would like to be one of those people that looks like they just rock climbed their way into the conference hall to do the keynote to 3,000 people. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about that a little bit. How do you translate the owner mindset or mentality into the daily grind? I know you used to talk about loving the grind, learn to love the grind, as you used to say on the old podcast. And now you've got the new one, the owner's crap mind. mind. So yes. How? What is the owner's mind? Like, I know it's a show, but also, like, what is it you're doing with that podcast? And again, how do we translate the owner's mind into daily life about choosing to do our goals, even if we don't feel like it versus con like you said, condoning our excuses. Yeah. I mean, th that's probably the biggest uh, slice in the, in the, in the air for me was that, that big line that I drew that said, I'm not going to allow excuses anymore. Your excuses are never going to be as interesting as the story of how you got it done. And once I made that true, and it's really hard. Like it is so difficult for someone to make that choice. But once you never allow an excuse to pass your lips again, and you own stuff. You just take responsibility for it. Like I was late to do an interview just a little bit before this one. And I just owned it. I said, hey, I really had to poop. And, you know, <laughs> nice. you know, and quite literally and, 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 but whatever. And so I think that with the owner's mind, so the guts of the podcast, there's a few things I changed between that and the human business way. First off, I had, I had, we closed the human business works corporation and merged it into owner media group because we're saying, Hey, this is the one thing. This is owner is our thing. And so we wanted to be really clear on that too. It was a LLC and we turned it into an S corporation, but that's boring. Um, the owner's mind podcast, I had a few things in mind. One was make a format that wasn't entirely interview related, um, although I've been doing mostly interviews. And two, this whole owner's mindset, I basically have seven tenets, not unlike I had five or so for the human business way. But what I say for an owner's mindset, and this is your answer to how do you learn to love the grind still, is first off envision, like what's your big vision of what you want to get done? Because a lot of times people are out there just flailing and it's because they really don't have a vision. It's like saying my GPS is broken. And I say, well, did you plot in a course? And then you could just look sheepishly at the ground. Um, you need a good vision. And then commit. Commit is the most important word. Uh, I always joke that it's kind of weird to say that as a divorced guy, but you know, commit doesn't mean you're always going to be perfect and it doesn't mean you're always going to make the right choices. But once you're sort of pushing yourself in a certain direction, see it through as best as you can. Uh, after that is invest. After that is act. Then communicate, connect, and serve. And to me, all of those things together equal how do you make the grind worth it? Um, you know, I've lately we've we've had a couple of months where the revenue just wasn't there and we're having to really dig in for the first time in my business career. You know, the numbers aren't making uh, not meeting the, the sides. And so, you know, I say to myself every single day, did I do three things that are going to push me closer to sales? And if the answer is no, then how committed am I? Do you know what I mean? Because what else was I doing that was somehow more important? Did, you know, was that trip to Trader Joe's vital? Like, did I just have something else in the fridge I could eat? But no, I just lost 48 minutes to that trip down and back, which becomes almost like an excuse. So it's an it's a interesting way to drive yourself, Eric. And the other thing that's true about it is that um, when you leave yourself no wiggle room, you get a lot more creative a lot faster in, in executing what needs to be done. So to me, it's just as simple as even taking out a sticky note and writing these three things will be done today. And you just hope you make them, you know, good enough sized. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, and that's, that it brings to mind, you said, uh, crap, I don't know what it was you said, but you said the thing that made me think of the whole necessities, the, the mother of invention, I think limitation and even desperation to a certain extent of, Things got to change, so I got to make those changes, and I'm the one who owns it, so let's go. Right. I mean, uh, constraint is absolutely one of the best driving forces of uh, creativity going. And for instance, one of the things that people say to me a real lot is they're like, you know, you seem to talk in tweets. Like, you seem to talk in, in sentences that are really easy to fit into 140 characters. And I say, well, I've been on Twitter since March of, uh, sorry, October of 2006. 
I would say that I've had a good long time to practice how to be a decent tweeter. Maybe there's some intention behind that. And then the little light bulb goes on and they think, wow, I can tweet anything he says. And what do you know? I'm very tweetable, it turns out. So, you know, I think that constraint is a fun thing. Uh, It also helps you focus a lot more. And there's no one, you know, if I ask you right now how many tabs you have open on your browser, maybe none because you're recording the show. But when you reboot Chrome or whatever, 28 tabs will open because that's what we all do. And so learning how to, to give away the myth of multitasking has really changed my business prospects as well. And I used to think that I needed to run 10 different projects at once, and I'm trying to minimize that as much as humanly possible now. Somebody's listening to us right now, and they're like, I, I think I get what you're saying about being an owner, but uh, where do I start? What would, what would you say to them? You know, I mean, so the first thing is if, you, if you've got the day job still and you're thinking, I want to, you know, run my own thing, that's great. I mean, you could do a bunch of different projects and pilots to decide what you want to do, you know, a little bit at a time. There was this great story Alex Franzen told where she, she interviewed this guy who he really wanted to open his own bed and breakfast. And he was a professional chef and he wasn't really quite a hotelier. And his wife said, you know, well, we've got the spare room in this house. Why don't you just put that room up on Airbnb and see how it goes? just to manage just one room. And so that's what the story ended up being called was just one room. And so I stole that for my book uh, a little bit because I thought it was such a great story because he learned everything he wanted about how to be a hotelier and how to run a bed and breakfast from just managing one room on Airbnb. Didn't have to give up the day job, basically just kind of learned some of the skills, decided he loved it, made a profit and went, oh. And so they converted a few more rooms, then they moved out of that house, then they bought a few more houses. So now they've, they're, that's their job. But Start somewhere small, take small bites, try a test run, try a, a pilot program of some kind and and be really clear on what success looks like to you. I mean, that's the other thing we always get kind of weird about these things is we're like, I think I'm going to go out and do something. And most times people say to me the weirdest part, I think I'm going to start a blog because I'd like to run my own business. And I always say, well, that's those are two different sentences, you know. <laughs> Yeah, unless you're unless you're thinking your blog is going to make tons of money advertising, and then I let him in on the sad truth that with two hundred thousand uniques a month, ChrisBrogan dot com did not make me a rich man uh, advertising. So, you know, it's a lot of work to to shake people of some of those feelings. But Eric, the, the real answer is start somewhere and start like smallish, and then take your next biggest step. I mean, we learn most everything by a mix of training, failing, and then building. So. The TFB method is uh, alive and well. Nice. And and be a freak. No question. So speaking of the book, uh, The Freak Shall Inherit the Earth, Entrepreneurship for Weirdos, Misfits, and World Dominators. What makes a freak the best type of an owner? I, I think because of just the raw passion. You know, I think that it's the whole deal uh, – is that if you have a whole lot of passion to, about what you want to do and, and, and you know that you, if you got stuck in an elevator with someone for four hours and you would talk to them about this thing that you're into for four hours, or the way James Altucher says it is, if you went to the bookstore, what section do you stick in and what section would they have to like tell you they're closing the store and you're still there? That's what you're, you're likely a freak about. And so once you find that thing you're really passionate about, that community you have the opportunity to serve, then comes how do you, you know, make some kind of business that's helpful to somebody else. And so I think that there's a lot of opportunities to uh, figure out some business around that, which is kind of why I put the book together. And uh, it's, it's sort of entrepreneurship from the ground up kind of a mindset for the kind of people who maybe don't normally think of themselves as that kind of person. But in there, there's all kinds of interesting freaks. There's, you know, Mark Echo, who started like airbrushing girls' fingernails and making spray paint uh, T-shirts and whatever, and then uh, ran, you know, made more than a billion dollars in earnings so far and hangs out with guys like George Lucas. Uh, Tony Hawk, the professional skateboarder. Sam uh, Claudione from Dogfish Head, who is one of my favorite examples. Um, RJ Diaz from a company called Industry Portage, who is in the construction and uh, architect business and decided he was a, he was a clothes fiend and wanted to make a accessory brand where he made all kinds of duffel bags and things. So I think that there's just so many people that, uh, really have a cool opportunity to, to tell a story of, you know, what really crazy raw passion can mean and what you could do with that sort of passion. So it's a, it's a good time to be a freak, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, Definitely. Well, I'm I'm in the club. I'm a I'm a proud freak. Hashtag proud <laughs> freak. Um, dude, our time's up. So, uh, where can people find you? And you definitely need to come back on the show. 
Oh, well, thank you. Um, you know, swing by ownermag.com. And if you're willing, grab my newsletter because that is really the best thing I do every single week. And when you're on my newsletter, it just means you can hit reply whenever you want and you could just directly drop me a line. That makes me so happy every time. Awesome. And I did that this week. It is true. Thank you. So awesome. Chris, thanks so much for being here. My utter pleasure. And, you know, happy birthday. Thank you. Wasn't that great? I love talking with Chris. It was awesome to uh, see him at Michael Stelzner's awesome Social Media Marketing World Conference a couple weeks ago in San Diego. Again, happy birthday to Chris. It was uh, really cool to talk with you on my birthday and then release our conversation on your birthday. Ownership. Man, guys, this concept. I mean, just don't let this pass you by. Ponder it. Think about it. Take a walk. Re-listen to this episode even. Go back Take a look at what Chris was saying about being the CEO of your own desk and then transfer that into the rest of your life. Just passivity is just – it's for losers. Passivity is for losers, guys. You can't get anything you want in life without stepping up to the challenge and and realizing that ultimately if anything is going to happen in life for you, you're going to have to not just accept what's handed to you but – Put in some of the hard work when the opportunities arise and even make opportunities happen for yourself. And none of that happens by sitting back and just accepting what happens to you. You have to take ownership for your decisions, your feelings, your life. You have to take ownership. And I guess this is a cool place. I can just do a quick little plug here. I mean, Jim Woods and I wrote a book called Ready, Aim, Fire, A Practical Guide to Making and Achieving Your Goals. And the whole theme of ownership runs through that book that if you want anything, you have to set goals and then you start moving towards it. I mean, you could hear Chris talking about it. Like he has done so much with his physical health. It's one of the the most just inspiring things as I see him taking those gym selfies. I mean, it, it makes me feel like, dude, if Chris can do it, I can do it. And that's not saying like, oh, I'm better than him. It's saying if Chris is consistently getting out there and he's got people that kick his butt too, that's the point, but he's out there, he's doing it. And so it makes me realize I can do it too. We all need that, you know? So anyway, if you want to grab our book, Jim and I, uh, you can grab that at readyaimfirebook.com. Check that out. So I promised you I was going to let you know some of the shows that I've been listening to. Some of them are uh, pretty brand new. Uh, Number one, let me give a shout out to uh, Dave Delaney's New Business Networking Radio. You can find that in iTunes. Just go – just type in New Business Networking. You'll find it. Dave Delaney actually is like the networker's networker. He's down in Nashville. He's like the most connected guy I know. Like everybody seems to know him. Uh, him and Jared Easley. So you should check out uh, and check out Jared Easley's Starve the Doubts. Another new one that I'm listening to is go to uh, Defy the Plateau. That's by Ben Dempsey. You should check that out. Defy the Plateau. Honestly, Ben is another one of those ones where I see him out there doing what Chris is doing, where they're just like, look, I'm not standing still. I'm not going to just be passive. I'm not just going to accept what's being given to me. I'm going to decide that one, it's not bad to want things in life. Two, that if I want those things, I'm going to have to go and take ownership of my decisions, my actions, my strategy, and start moving towards it. And he is. And that's what the defy the plateau means is Ben's got a much better explanation of what it is and how to do it. But if you think of a plateau and you're just like, look, it's one long straight line of nothingness, defy that. Move higher, move higher up. So anyway, Ben Dempsey, check that out. Go to iTunes, type in Defy the Plateau. Uh, and one other one that I really like, and this one's kind of a <laughs> – honestly, this one's um, – it's mentioned, been mentioned on the show once before. It's called Life in the Woods, and this one is very similar to this show. It, and in fact, it's, it's very much a show that, you know, honestly, I wish I was doing. It's a very cool show. It's, it's very much – how creative people get work done. And it's fascinating. I love it. Uh, Still one of my favorite episodes on there was the two-part episode with Derek Webb. And uh, yeah, my friend uh, Blake Stratton, he puts together just an amazing show over at uh, lifeinthewoodsblog.com or just go to iTunes and go Life in the Woods and you'll find that. And and, uh, Blake Stratton's uh, interview with Derek Webb 
just uh, uh, Jim and I, Jim Woods and I mentioned that on the show before, and it was just it's one of those mind blowing kind of things in terms of just you have to listen anyway. Point being, there's some shows right there. So new business networking, defy the plateau, and life in the woods, and don't forget to go grab Chris Brogan's the owner's mind podcast, his new podcast. I've just been eating it up and it's just, it's awesome. I love it. So it's a mainstay already in my iPod. Anyway, so that is the episode. There you go. I'm going to list all these shows in the show notes for this episode at beyondthetodolist.com slash 65. You can find them all there. Don't forget that this episode is brought to you by the podcast masterclass where you can take your podcast from average to amazing, to take advantage of the $200 discount, go to beyondthetodolist.com slash podcast masterclass and type in the code to do. Don't forget the space for that class is limited. So sign up quickly for the next session. And again, go to beyondthetodolist.com slash podcast masterclass and use the code to do. Hey, if you're liking this podcast, Head on over to iTunes real quick. Just type in Beyond the To-Do List in iTunes and just let me know what you think by giving a rating or review. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next episode. Beyond the To-Do List is a proud member of the Noodle Mix Network. Find more of our award-winning and award-nominated podcasts to make you think, laugh, and succeed at noodle.mx. Learn how to podcast, theorize over the TV shows Once Upon a Time, Once Upon a Time in Wonderland, and Under the Dome, laugh with our clean comedy, delve into science fiction and philosophy, learn critical thinking from movie reviews, and more at noodle.mx.